Hi, everybody. Good evening. I'm Lisa Melandry. I'm the executive director here at the Contemporary Art Museum. And we are absolutely delighted to be a part of Design Week and to host this evening's talk. We're sort of thinking of this evening as a little bit of a closing reception for Green Varnish, the installation that you see outside that was designed site specifically for our courtyard by the Nomad Studio out of New York and its two principals, Laura Santine and William Roberts. And when we talked about doing a sort of living installation, a growing sculpture here at CAM and talked about the transformational qualities of doing something like that in a courtyard that is pretty brute in some ways in terms of its materials, its kind of grayness. We were very, very excited with the idea of coming up with something not only that would transform throughout its time here, it went up in May and obviously now it's September, um, and it's made up about, of about 7,000 individual plants of 14 varieties of sedum. And what we have seen over time is that some have grown, others have not done as well, some have taken over others. And the surface of this green carpet, which has unfurled in our space, has changed dramatically. What we've also noticed is that it has really taken advantage of its environment in that it's relatively hostile out there in a St. Louis summer. You know, we have a lot of heavy duty sun, although this summer we also had a lot of rain. And what are these architectural elements of the building, including this kind of lattice work or this trellis, have really, really added to and changed the way that this kind of is dynamic throughout the day, both in terms of light and shadow. Furthermore, it's really given us a chance to think about what does greening mean? What is green, right? What is um, literal greening in terms of planting something that's green versus greening in the ecological sense? And tonight, I am really, really delighted to have uh, Dr. Adrian Cerezo here to discuss this because I think it is a piece that invites many different perspectives and has really made us think very much about what is a garden, how do we control nature, and how does that change our experience also of what art is and the hybridization of what art is. So with that, I'd just like to say a few words about Dr. Cerezo. He holds a PhD with a focus on social ecology and developmental science from Yale University School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. I will also say you have some of the most wonderful titles I have ever heard, including the fact that he is currently the Chief Constructive Innovation Officer uh, for CREA Studio, He's a consultant for UNICEF Global Early Childhood Programs, a fellow at Yale University's Ziegler Center, trustee for Hippie USA, and adjunct professor of international sustainability policy at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. And we are very, very excited to hear how this piece has really functioned as a jumping off point for these much larger global issues that we will hear more about tonight. And with that, please join us. Thank you so much. Good evening. Um, let's see. Good? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, then we're off to a good start. If I can just figure out where that is. Okay. Um, I did something I don't usually do, which is uh, put together presenter notes for this lecture because it is a lecture like none other that I have ever done. Uh, and a challenge that I took on because uh, I think it's uh, such a beautiful toy out there and I just wanted to play with it. And Lisa was uh, yeah, very nice about allowing me to do that. So, so I'm, it's going to seem a little bit formal at moments because I'm sort of going through my notes because I don't want to miss out on some of the things that I want to make sure I say. Uh, and on other times, might, it might not, so I hope you can bear with me. Um, so, thank you, Lisa. I, I, it's a pleasure to be here, for sure, and 
I think that any evening that begins with a beer garden is bound to get at least interesting, so let's see what happens. Um, the reflections I am about to share were sparked by a conversation that I had with Lisa a couple of months ago about the green varnish. I had not even seen the installation but then, but she described how the plants in the installation were chosen to be sturdy, relatively easy to maintain, long-lasting, as well as visually interesting. And so that's how they ended up with this selection of sedum. There's nothing, nothing strange about that because anybody who gardens knows that that's a common challenge that you're, that you're addressing. What struck me as interesting is that somebody mentioned once the selection was made that this, was, this installation was now not natural because the plants were not local prairie species, if I remember correctly. Do I remember correctly? There was alcohol flowing, so who knows? Oddly enough, as I started interacting with the installation and sitting here, one of the things that, that also happened is that um, many people have remarked how pleasant the courtyard feels now that there is some nature in it. This is where things get interesting for me because the statements are both contradictory and false. Um, because if you think about it, if nature is all there is, all there has been and all, all there will be, meaning plants, animals, rocks, water, people, antimatter more lately, dark matter, and even every item in the Walmart bargain section, which doesn't seem like nature, but there it is. Then nature cannot be absent. So the idea of not nature is impossible, or it cannot spontaneously become present. It has always been there. So I have spent a good portion of my academic life considering the ways we understand, narrate, and interact with nature. These considerations are fundamental in understanding our current environmental practices, which is what I do for a living mostly, and to build a more sustainable future, which is what we sh all should be doing for a living. So in that pursuit, in trying to understand these mechanics of how we think about nature and how we interact with it, I have gone through a bunch of roads that includes learning about the natural history of the human brain and the biology of the human mind, um, the cultural histories of humans and the cultural history of science, quantum physics, chaos theory, complex dynamic system theory, and how do we think about those systems, especially when we think about nature as one of those. Um, uh, it has led more recently to a fascination with metaphors and art. Uh, and art as the ultimate container for metaphors, I think. And the role our artistic impulse plays in providing tentative answers to questions that are really unanswerable for now, but eventually maybe we can draw from those metaphors and move our knowledge forward. Um, and how all of those things intervene in the process of understanding nature, our destructive behavior sometimes, as well as our efforts to live more sustainably. If this lecture works, it will thread together the following topics. The origin of the garden in our mind, how the garden in our mind has allowed us to thrive as a species in the past, why it might not be enough to take on the challenges of the present and the future, and how a contemporary art museum can save the world, if it works. Let's hope we get there. In the spirit of drawing on art and to explore the complex and ineffable, uh, the, the drawing on art to explore the com complex and ineffable, and given that I am art adjacent but not really an artist, uh, I have invited some artists, honest to goodness artists, to help me put together this presentation. Sitting in the front row is Carly Ann Faye Jackson. Graci she graciously agreed to document a trek through the nature of green varnish. Uh, you'll be able to enjoy the resulting photographic essay uh, in a second as we trek, trek to, through the installation and the multiple provocations that, it's, that it contains. Carly then will be joining us, joining me after the lecture to answer questions and be part of what I hope will be a great conversation about these topics. I will also draw on some of my favorite authors to complement some of the concepts 
but mostly because they are sort of the audio guide in the garden in my own mind. So I wanted to share some of those ideas. Finally, I want to thank Lisa, Alex, uh, and the staff of CAM, as well as the amazing team at Nomad uh, for allowing me to play with their installation and encouraging, encouraging me to take these reflections where they might lead. So, okay, let's just go for a walk. So, before we get, you saw how like we came into life with that flash. Um, um, before we get into that part, into the Garden of Eden, I wanted to talk about the actual empirical garden. The things that we know through empirical research about ecology, because that seems like the most appropriate frame to then have a discussion about the, the one that inhabits us. Um, so, there are not many rules, but the key rules are that in the real nature, the system is complex and it is dynamic. And therefore, it is very difficult to document completely, which means that it's very difficult to uh, model, which means it's very difficult to predict. So, this is something very important to keep in mind, that as much as we would like nature to be something that is accessible and understandable, and it can be in certain scales, when we're talking about the larger nature, uh, we're talking about a system that is essentially incomprehensible to individual humans, uh, essentially impossible to model, essentially impossible to predict. Um, this is actually, uh, I was having a conversation recently about climate change, and this is a point that most people don't realize that because when people ask, tell me about climate change, the answer usually begins with, well, it's complicated. The truth is that it's not. The environment, when there, is, there aren't forcings, it's complex. But when we put a lot of carbon in the atmosphere, it does only one thing, it makes it warmer. A bunch of things happen after that, but it becomes more predictable because you are loading the dice, literally. I mean, not literally, but you're loading the system with one particular thing that has a very specific outcome. So that is not how nature works normally. That's how it works when we force it. So that's one part of it. The second part of it is that evolution has a couple of rules that uh, <laughs> need to be pointed out because we are, a lot of us are still trying to sort of rid ourselves of social Darwinism and all the evils that came with that, including that false idea that the point of evolution is for the strongest to survive. The truth is that the point of evolution is for, a, it, it just seems to want more diversity. And it seems to do well when there is the most diversity. So the strongest is not the, the strongest animal. It's actually the organism that has the most diversity for one simple reason. Because the most diversity you have, the most answers you have for questions that haven't been asked. And that's how it works, because we can know only about what helped us get here, but we don't know what will come in the future. So the more diversity we have, the more capacity we have to adapt. And that's what makes a species do well. Um, humans have been particularly good at that. Uh, because we have certain features that I'm about to discuss that help us make predictions better than other organisms. But it's also because as a species, we are very diverse. And as the more we celebrate that and the more we create spaces for that diversity to thrive, the better we are as a species. So imagine that. So beginning with those sort of basic rules of nature, let's talk about Eve and Adam. We're in the garden, and I hope you're loving the photos because it was such a great experience to just get really personal with some of these individual uh, plants. Um, and, and there's the first people. And what is it that makes them the first people other than different from other species that came before us? And 
Uh, some of those features have to do with the fact that we have self-awareness, like most other organisms don't have. There are other organisms that have self-awareness, but we have a ton of capacity to, to, to do that. And uh, we're also very plastic, we learn. We learn socially, we learn as cultures, we learn individually. Our body learns when we are developing in the womb, our body learns when we're born and developing as a child. Our body, we're constantly modifying ourselves to be, uh, to be able to participate and thrive in the environment. And again, other organisms do that, but we seem to do that really well. We also have the capacity for synthesis and symbolic communication. And, and as you start adding up these things, it makes us a very special species because we can do a very good job of identifying patterns and increasing our capacity to remember, document, remember, and predict. And this is how we sort of gamed evolution because we're one of the few species that can know with some certainty what will happen in 50 years, in 100 years, and not wait like the dinosaurs for, uh, or think like the dinosaurs. I mean, if I were a dinosaur, I would be a T-Rex and I would be eating other dinosaurs and every day would be the same day. Isn't it very pleasant? And then an asteroid had happened and no more dinosaurs. So humans, we're better at, at predicting and therefore we have a higher likelihood uh, for survival. Um, because, I mean, for those things that we can predict if we do what we need to do. I, I, we were just talking about climate change, so. Um, so now we're there, and, uh, and I wanted to do that flash again because now, now you can sort of really get into the group here. We're the apex of creation in the Garden of Eden. Uh, just like in so many Bibles and so many stories of origins of so many cultures, we're, we're it. Like, if you need to think about the species, that is the species, it's us, and there we are. And let me just set the scenery a little bit more so that we get a little bit more. Um, this is one of my favorite poems because it's so playful, so. <clears throat> when faces called flowers float out of the ground, and breathing is wishing, and wishing is having, but keeping is downward and doubting and never. It's April. Yes, April, my darling. It's spring. Yes, the pretty birds frolic as spry as can fly. Yes, the fish, the little fish gamble as glad as can be. Yes, the mountains are dancing together. When every leaf opens without any sound, and wishing is having, and having is giving, but keeping is doting, and nothing, and nonsense. Alive, we're alive, dear. It's kiss me now, spring. Now the pretty birds hover, so she and so he. Now the little fish quiver, so you and so I. Now the mountains are dancing, the mountains. When more than was lost has been found, has been found, and having is giving, and giving is leaving, but keeping is darkness, and winter, and cringing. It's spring. All our night becomes day. Oh, it's spring. All the pretty birds dive to the heart of the sky. All the little fish climb through the mind of the sea. All the mountains are dancing, are dancing. So, here we are, in this world, that we feel completely at ease in and it's all beautiful, and we are totally in it. So what happened? <laughs> why, why don't we live there anymore? Um, so, and, and is it ever true that it, that it existed? Uh, because we seem to have a, a very strong recollection. It's like a ghost memory of this place that we have been in uh, but we never remember when it was. It's like something that you kind of remember after a very drunken night, um, but you're not sure if you did it or not. And so one of the things that I've been studying is um, what, what is that? 
what is that thing that, that tells us this story of a garden? And why is it a garden and not a forest or a jungle? Because uh, it could be so many other things. Anyway, I'm talking now about these ghosts in the garden because um, as it turns out, there is a memory of that place in our head. It's a physical memory. Um, psychologists call it core knowledges. And some of the core knowledges, so that you have an idea of how this works, that, that we have encoded along with our genetic makeup when we are born, has to do with being able to count to two. Every baby in every culture, in every part of the world, knows the difference between one and two. And it's called the one-two-many theory because, well, one, two, comma, many theory. Because they can count to two, but after two, it's just many. Um, so uh, most children, I'm, the great majority of children, will be able to tell the difference between one and two, and that's something they're born with. It's a physical, uh, it, it's almost like a conversation that your body is having and your mind is benefiting from it. In the same way, we have all of these sensors in our body that are giving us signals about what is an appropriate place to be in. When studies have been done of places that have different kinds of temperature, it has been found that people that are in places that have a temperature that is similar to a temperate zone in the spring are more relaxed than other people. It has also been found that where there is running breeze that is cool, people are more relaxed. So if you can open a window in your office, even if you don't open it, if you can open a window, it has been found to lower the, lo the blood pressure of the people in that space. That if you can see sunlight and see the, not just the, the sun, but the way the light changes throughout the day, you will do better. That if you are in a place where there's clear running water, you will do better. That if you're in a place that is like a garden where there are trees, but you can still see in the distance, we call this prospect and refuge. The idea that you can be protected, but at the same time see everything that's around you, you are more relaxed. And this is all our body sending us all of these signals in encoded as, how do I feel? And what I think happens with the conception of the Garden of Eden, among other things, is that we sort of make a compilation of all of those signals. And when we try to imagine, like you think, where would I be right now? It starts revealing itself as this narrative of a place that looks like that. And if you look at images of a, a, lot, of, a lot of places that we describe as the Garden of Eden, they have similar characteristics to these places that send our body signals that make us feel better. Of course, there's slight variation with that, and I've been working a lot in the Arctic recently, and <laughs> my colleagues there are very funny to me because they say that it's a really, really warm day when it's like, and, and you can work outside without a shirt when it's like 36 degrees outside. So there's some calibration that happens environmentally, but our body has this capacity to tell better spaces from others. And I think in the process of it being handled, it's also being turned into a narrative. Uh, it goes on to other things that have to do with uh, the way the brain talks to itself, but we'll get into that maybe or not. Um, so. So there's that real Garden of Eden inhabiting us. But there's also this cultural Garden of Eden that is inside of our mind. Um, and, and this is a really important part of this conversation because, um, and, and since we talked about evolution, the, the brain that we have is the brain that we evolved. We don't have, there, there was no plan exactly, well, depending on who you ask, but let's say for the purposes of this discussion, no plan. It was something that happened because it was a, the benefits of certain kinds of features just accumulated as they were allowing us to reproduce and have babies that had similar characteristics and that moved forward. So with that in mind, uh, we have the brain we have. And the brain we have cannot contain the full complexity of the universe. We have a brain that allows us to 
handle just what it can handle. And there are physiological reasons uh, There are physiological reasons to, uh, to, to have a brain that works that way. When you're born, and this is one feature of being human, and, and I'm going to quote this, and I'm, I always misquote it, so I'm hoping I'm right. You're born with three-fifths of the mass of your brain. Between the time that you're born and the time that you end infancy, you develop the other two-fifths of your brain. So the, the mass of your brain is developing as you're interacting with the environment. Uh, but, and, and that's something most people know. Uh, what most people don't know or don't understand fully is that this brain that we have is very consumptive, consumptive of energy. It's very energy inefficient. If it were to do, if it were to handle everything, if it were to understand everything, it, will con it would consume all of our energy and we wouldn't be able to move. We would be running out of energy all the time. And so, as a, as a way of surviving, the brain learned how to prune itself. And so there is this process called pruning that happens at a point in infancy, I mean in, in early childhood, between five and nine years, where the neuron, neural networks that are not sturdy enough will basically fall off. They will be abandoned. And, and once that happens, what they what, hap what just happened is that this is an expression of plasticity. We end up with a brain that is presumably good enough to operate in the environment we, we are developing because it part, a good part of it was created while we were in that environment, but not so much brain that it would consume all of our energy. So the brain is counseling itself. Uh, it's also set up so that neural networks are rich the end of their, of their process at some point, and they stop. Uh, so so we, we don't do well when, uh, when things just are too complex and, too, and, and we cannot understand them. And we create ways of moving away from that so that we survive, so that the brain survives and we, we can close loops. Um, think about the days where you have had something that worries you, and, and you're obsessively thinking about that thing. How that is almost physically painful, but it is also very damaging to your brain. And it tends to lead sometimes when it's not controlled to mental illness, because what's happening is that this, this process that it's supposed to at some point reach a point of end doesn't. And so now all sorts of other things happen that are not great for the brain. So, the, what all of that means is that dissonance is bad for the brain. And now think about the, the contradiction here or, or the interesting challenge here that we're facing as a species because we have this brain that is like pretty much no other species where we can think about abstract, symbolic things like no other species that we know of. But because of the brain we have, the brain doesn't know how to honor one of some of the key principles of nature, that it is complex and dynamic, and it's consistently difficult to make rules about. Uh, so we, we create metaphors as a way of uh, getting a handle on that. And one of those really important metaphors or tropes is the metaphor of balance. Um, so let me give you a short tour, take a break and give you a short tour of the I hope you appreciate the handy dandy guide map. So balance, um, and this is something that, that is uh, inextricably tied to the garden idea because it actually, in, in the mythology, they are both together. The idea that when we're there, we're in the optimum setting. And when you think about, uh, again, mythologies of what happens after death and what happens when you reach some kind of enlightenment, what happens, what we tend to think about is a state in which nothing is moving. We have reached an optimum state 
and we just want to leave it like that. And the Garden of Eden is like that. It's a place that never changes. If, if you think about all the ways we imagine it, nobody's really thinking about winter skiing in the Garden of Eden. It's always temperate, it's always uh, kind of summery, it's always kind of green, there are always fruiting trees. It's reached this optimum state, and we call that a state of balance. The, the reality is that uh, in terms of ecology, balance exists, uh, homeostasis exists, but it's one thing, one state, one possible state in a multitude of possible states and in a dynamic system. That means that, yeah, it reached that, what we would consider balance at one point, but in these constant interactions between the environment and other elements in the environment, things continue to change. So why? Why the idea of balance and why is it so important? Uh, and why is it so important to this talk? Because here we are as humans trying to make sense of this inordinately complex world. And so we create this metaphor as a way of simplifying the world that as long as we predict the things that will create the possibility of getting closer to this state of balance, then we're, we'll be kind of all right. And think about first humans, the Adam and Eve of evolution, trying to make sense of this huge world with a brain that was just giving them basic information and they were an, and a culture that was still trying to figure out a lot of things. Um, well, as it turns out, they were not so different from us. They're, most of the people right now, even though there is sense, this idea got carried into religion for most religions and it got carried into science after religion because as you know, a lot of the Western universities began as monasteries and uh, cloisters. And so the first project of academia was to prove the existence of God and to show how God worked through the Bible and through religious texts. And so when that became what we know as science, one of the things that was carried over, according to scientific historians, is this idea of balance, that all systems have an optimum state. And one of the things that we're trying to figure out is what is that optimum state so that we can get systems to that optimum state. And once we do that, then we can go on vacation because it's all taken care of. It took until the very beginning of the 20th century for uh, what are now called ecologists to ask themselves a question. Recently, chemists and physicists had started thinking about the idea of entropy, that the, the universe tends towards less order, not more order. And they asked themselves, why is it that that would be different for ecology? And so they started doing actual experiments in ecosystems and realized that there is no substantive uh, evidence to prove that balance is a potentially permanent state or a potentially optimum state for any organism. Um, so here we are, still so many years later, we know so much about science, and I bet that a lot of you, when, they, when you get asked, just like it happens to me every once in a while, when you get asked, what, what are we trying to do here? How are we going to solve this? Well, we have to reach a balance between this thing and this other thing. Or in the process of gaining, uh, moving towards sustainability, the whole project is to uh, promote the balance between humans and nature. In fact, Sierra Club, uh, World Wildlife Fund, some of the most, the biggest, best funded conservation organizations in the world, world have balance in their mission statement as their ultimate goal. Whereas that is not the reality of the environment. So, so this is a really key thing because here is where um, our conceptions of the world that are fed by this whole process of being inhabited by this garden of Eden and being an organism that has the brain that we have starts rub, like creating friction against the actual world and the way the world works. So a little bit more of a tour. Are we doing well so far so good? I'm wearing my reading glasses so you're all like fuzzy blobs and I don't even know if you're, smile for a second just to, or do I have to say something funny? Yeah, I guess I do. It's a tough crowd. There you go. Okay, 
Yes. So if you if you have like any burning questions, we we should have plenty of time to talk. So, uh, but but if it's like a burning burning question, I'm perfectly okay with addressing it. So science, and here is one awesome aspect of being human. We developed this thing called the scientific process and the scientific method. So as much as we have these mythologies that helped us live through a lot of our evolution, we were also going towards this other method that is intended to uh, take out mythology and replace it with facts and reflect, replace it with information rather than opinions so that we can make decisions and make predictions that are better so that we have. So that's super powerful. Uh, it, it allows us to make these incremental approximations to the working of the universe. And as you see the history of humanity, you see that the things that we knew, say, a thousand years ago, well, actually, we haven't learned that much in a thousand years, which is kind of sad, but say 10,000 years ago. And the things that we know now are a little bit more sophisticated or ever more sophisticated. One problem of this process is that our mind is at odds with it. And because our mind cannot contain the, and process all of the information in the world, the fact that we can collect that information uh, doesn't mean that much because it's very unlikely that we'll be able to make sense of it in terms of concrete, empirical, reproducible, descriptive ways. We can do it for simpler systems that are very reduced. And that's why science tends to be reductionist. But we have a really hard time doing it when the systems get much bigger. Um, and that brought me to this thing that, that, I'm, that I love. I love Jorge Luis Borges. And I've loved, loved him for years. And he wrote this thing on the exactitude of science. It's a very, very short, short story. Um, in that empire, the art of cartography attained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city, and the map of the empire, the entirety of a province. In time, those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied, and the cartog cartographer's guild struck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire itself, and which coincided point for point with the empire. The following generations, who were not so fond of the study of cartography as their forebearers had been, saw that map, saw that, that vast map was useless. And not without some pitilessness was it that they delivered it to the inclements of the sun and winters. Uh, in the deserts of the West, still today, there are tattered ruins of the map inhabited by animals and beggars. In all the land, there is no other relic of the disciples of geography. Um, that is the big challenge of science. Yes, we can collect all of that information. And in the time of Borges, it was this uh, absurd map. But think about it, the internet. We were just talking about that. It is perhaps the most uh, amazingly accessible compilation of information that has ever been. To what end? Has the world become better because we can do that? And so this is something to think about um, as we keep walking. But we take all of that, and we are industrious. We're artifact makers. That's another thing that makes us what we are. And not that that is a uniquely human feature. A lot of our organisms have them. But if you think of all of the features that make humans human all together, then you realize how powerful this is, because we have insight and self-awareness, and we make objects, and we're predicting. And so we're making objects that are based on what we think we are and what we predict, predict we will need in, in terms of our cultural life and our physical life. And, and then we make things that, like the things in the bargain area of Walmart that who knows, but 
Well, we make objects and we modify the world, and this is where the design part comes in, if anybody was wondering. And uh, we make ideas, we make beliefs, we bring to this process, uh, the ideas and belief that, beliefs that we bring to this process affect the short and long-term impact that we have in the landscape and the processes of the landscape itself. So this is something to keep in mind. We're bringing all of that in there, and what do we do with it? And if we want to move towards a more enlightened way of looking at nature, what you would call going back to the garden, if you thought that that was the ultimate goal, how have we done it in history? Well, one way is the, the whole uh, culture of environmentalism, the whole process of what we call environmentalism. The reason the word cathedrals is there is because American environmentalism was really settled by John Muir, who went to the West and went into the forest, and he called them cathedrals of all things, cathedrals of democracy because in this land of wilderness, this was shared land. And it was a statement to the power of a democratic country that we had these cathedrals that God had made uh, in his reading of nature for everybody to share. Because in Europe, those special landscapes were reserved for royalty. And so it is in other countries where they're either reserved for the gods or they're reserved for the people who have the most power in America, it is a shared project. But the, the object of the shared project, as according to Muir, is that, that those, given that those are monuments to what we are and, and the power of God in the world, they are not to be touched. And so the park service as we know it right now grew out of that. This idea that these cathedrals have to be preserved just like any other cathedral in the world. As you can imagine, the myth of balance and the myth of the Garden of Eden is completely infused in that thinking about nature. And especially for communities that were now not so dependent on, their, on the outside world for their everyday life, because John Muir could go to a restaurant and eat. He didn't have to plant his own food anymore. He had money that he could use to get access to food and other materials. So he didn't have a direct rela relationship to the land as other cultures do. So he could make these broad statements that this is land to not be touched forever and ever, and it will be a, a sacred place for a, non, for a secular country. Um, but then the other side of that question is uh, what Gifford Pinchot proposed. He, had, he uh, actually went to my school, which was pretty cool knowing that. He, he began what, what is now the Forest Service out of the Department of Agriculture, because he, his contention was, yeah, that's fine. Where do we get food, and what do we use to build houses? And so one of the things that is embedded in the environmentalist discourse that is, to me, really interesting, and again, has to do with what are we trying to protect when we're moving towards this Garden of Eden, is this idea that uh, humans are somehow uh, not part of nature. And so when we were talking at the, about, at the very beginning about what is nature, that some people said, no, that's not nature. And then some people said, isn't it great that now you have nature? When we're talking about that, one of the things that is playing itself out right there is also this idea that we are not part of the natural environment. In fact, the Oxford Dictionary defines nature as everything there is except people. Uh, and so that's really cool because they also talk about nature as being the essential characteristics of something. But when they're talking about what we would consider nature, the, the most authoritative dictionary in the English language, presumably, says, yes, everybody but humans. And when we do that, there are two side effects to that. We do things to the other parts of nature that are not really good because we believe that we have sort of a special deal um, with God or whoever we think we made that deal with. And so we're protected and we, we're allowed. We're stewards. We're not the, the owners, but we're taking care of it for somebody that decided that we're good enough to do that. 
The other part, which is something that grew out of the environmentalist agenda, and, and when I say the environmentalist agenda, I don't mean it like Rush Limbaugh would say it. I just mean the narrative of environmentalism uh, is that humans are also not appropriate in nature, that we are not fit for nature, that we are a form of virus. And a lot of the scientists that I know that have a very strong environmental ethic, I, I spend a lot of time interviewing them because it strikes me as odd that while they are such good scientists, they have this strong belief that humans are a pest and that the solution to a lot of the problems re regarding conservation have mostly to do with how do we get rid of humans. Uh, and so, and, and does that sound familiar? Because when we were behaving like humans that wanted to behave like gods, what happened? We got kicked out of the garden. And so some people believe that our way back to the garden is becoming virtuous again, like Muir. But some people believe maybe the garden is best left without people because we just screwed it up and we lost all of our chances. Um, so again, all of these ideas are, are being uh, fed into it. So, so now we're trying to make sense of how to put together conservation programs. And one of the things that I observed as a cultural anthropologist working at the Smithsonian, I, I did research on scientists, like people would do research on uh, indigenous communities. So I spent a lot of time interviewing scientists and looking at them at work. And uh, one of the things that really struck me as interesting was that while the scientists were scientists, they would never, ever voice an opinion without backing of uh, empirical data. When they gave a presentation in Panama, in Mexico, in all of the places that I saw them speaking publicly about conservation, they would say preposterous, hyperbolic, horrible things that would never be uttered in a, in a scientific conference. So I would ask them, what the heck? What is that about? And their answer was, well, it's so dire and people are so damaging that I feel that I have to scare them into action. And so our environmental self seems to be more driven by this idea of the garden and our scientific self, if we are good biologists and we're good uh, conservation biologists, is driven by the actual knowledge, empirical knowledge that it is a complex dynamic system and we have to do something to stay in it. So we're starting to climb up the mountain. So along with this idea of how do we intervene in a way that promotes sustainability from the perspective of environmentalism and how it, that is all infused with the idea of the Garden of Eden, there's also the technological part, the technological approach to it, which is also kind of contradictory because if you ask a lot of green designers, what is the goal of your project? What is the first word that will come to mind? We want to achieve a balance between people and nature. Or the more horrible version of that, a win-win situation. Or if they're really horrible, a win-win-win situation. Like, not horrible people, they're just horrible philosophers. Um, and so, this, there is this really funny, again, interplay between the idea that once we figure out the right technological approach, we will have overtaken these challenges and they won't be a worry anymore. I have a, a friend that calls it a fig leaf. Um, they use this image when talking about um, polar bear conservation. It, it's a long story that has to do with polar bear conservation, but the the punchline of the story is that they developed these rules like the listing of polar bears uh, in, in Alaska. And a lot of people think, well, it's taken care of. As we speak, there is a plan for recovery of polar bears in the Arctic being drafted by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So what, what is it to me? Now they're gonna take care of it like they did with the eagles and they did with the condors and they did with all of these species and using technical means, they fixed it. And I don't have to worry about that anymore. There's this little issue of no ice and melting ice caps that the US Fish and Wildlife can do very little about, but still, I can sort of release my stress about it because 
these people are good at their job and they're taking care of it. So the same thing with our approach to technology. Uh, when we think about this more simplified way of looking at conservation and sustainability, and it's so, so driven by using our, our impulse to create objects and to create uh, artifacts, then we end up with this thing that, that is maybe a, a cool thing, but it doesn't necessarily attend to all of the ways in which the world is complex. And by this idea that you can create balance, you are mostly uh, retrofitting the world to attend to your technology rather than creating technology that operates in the world as it is. So keeping the idea of no balance, keeping the idea of no equilibrium, keeping the idea of complex systems, keeping the idea of change, active in your mind, is a key building block in designing better. Because you, if you're going to design something that is going to be static and the apex of civilization, first of all, you, you'll probably fail, but then you will end up with something that is uh, probably not really good for people, not really good for nature. On Friday, I'm gonna be talking about the relationship between sustainability and uh, it's a workshop for the US Green Building Council and it's on this relationship between sustainability and uh, the sustainable development goals that are being developed right now and how true design for sustainable development has to include many more things than just the artifacts that you're creating and how they're going to be used by people. There are these other many things. So anyway, so we keep climbing up. I hope you're enjoying the photos. It's, uh, it's a little world in there. Okay, so I was going to title this part art, but there are two faces to art, and this gets into the business of why a contemporary art museum. Um, I think that one of the things that this myth of the Garden of Eden and the myth of balance of nature reveals, oddly enough, in my swimming around the world of art, is why are there places like the slam and why are there places like the Contemporary Art Museum? If you think about this uh, issue of, of art from the perspective of balance and the perspective of the trope of the Garden of Eden, you realize that the slam, the San Luis Art Museum, and not to pick on them, it's just that they're close. And, they're, I call them the Whitman sampler of art um, because they are one of everyone and they're all great, but it's not very extensive. It's just, anyway, uh, I love them. And, and they are the archive. They are the place that contains our best guess based on our many prejudices of what that long conversation has been. It's sort of the, art, the place where we go when we wanna here, the elements of this long conversation we have been having with ourselves for thousands of years. And, and we pick up on that. And in this archive, all of these ideas that were not yet ready to be expressed in other language than metaphorical language can be seen in metaphorical language and now we can bring them to our mind and decide whether we can add to that dialogue or not. Uh, or we can understand what they were saying or not. It is one of the containers of all of those metaphors that are contained in the art, are the archive of one of the most powerful archives of how we talk to each other as a species and, and the power of our species to remember itself and remember what we did before. Because when you're looking at that picture, actually that installation, there, there is an installation at the entrance of the, the, I don't know if it's still there, uh, of the San Luis Art Museum that has a lot of glass. And if you look at it, like the first time I saw it, I was wondering, yes, a lot of glass. Um, and it's a relatively contemporary, contemporary piece, but it is about Kristallnacht and the whole business of the horribleness that happened during Nazi Germany. And, and it's a memory of that. And we can remember not just uh, what, what was documented as words, but by virtue of this work, re get a, an insight on what it might have felt to be in that world that was so chaotic and so 
out of control for people that had no way of protecting themselves. So, so that archive is fundamentally important. The, the challenge of a retrospective museum and a, and a traditional museum is that, first of all, they make these assumptions are coming from the people who have the power to make them. And so in a city like St. Louis, the collections that are there are very telling not just of what these people thought it was, but who the people thought, who the people that were doing the thinking were. And, and so there's that part. But there's also a, the idea that because this is universal art that should speak to everybody and should always be preserved, an inordinate amount of money is spent on making sure that none of those things ever decay or change. That when you see every one of those paintings in there, they will all look the same. And in 200 years, they will look the same. And in 1,000 years, they will look the same. And so they are a kind of like a metaphor in themselves of the Garden of Eden, the idea that nothing changes. And, and, it, and it has a use, but it also, in the process of creating that kind of space, creates the idea that that is important and that should be done for pretty much everything. That if it's of value, it can never change. That is, if it's of value, it has to be universal. That if it is of value, it will be put in this uh, very special space and nothing that is outside of it is of as much value. Nothing that changes and decays is as much value, etc. So. There, are, there is this dialogue, again, and this tension between what it does to help us remember and what it does to uh, further these ideas of the balance of nature and the, the Garden of Eden. So then there's the laboratory. And that would be, I would say, a place like um, here. Where, you, where things decay, and they are dynamic, and they are changing. And they are a laboratory that is helping us document, narrate, and understand the world as a complex world. In their, if they do their work right, like I'm going to say you're doing, because if not, you're going to kick me out. But I also agree, this is a wonderful museum. And I've been so happy to be able to play with you these three years that I've been here. Um, then. We're talking about a laboratory that is exactly going into that direction, that the world is complex, that the world has many perspectives, that the world is constantly changing. And how do we create a space where we can present that and challenge our visitors to start thinking of the world that way? Again, think of a city like St. Louis. And when I say that, it's a euphemism for all of the things that have happened in the last few years in this city regarding prejudice and uh, segregation, and how helpful it is to have a place that constantly reminds you it has to change because that's the nature of nature. We just have to figure out how to move forward and to add diversity to a system that has been too stuck in one thing for too long. And so this is a laboratory where you try out those ideas and try out thinking in those ways. So that's how a place like a contemporary art museum, as much as people say that they are dis disconnected from reality and disconnected from everyday people, etc., maybe, but when it works well, it is one of the few places where people can embrace nature as it is rather than nature as our brain tells us it has to be so that we don't go crazy. So we can go a little bit crazy here for a little bit and learn things that we can bring into our life. And I think that's wonderful. When I was talking to um, the designers at Nomad, we had a wonderful conversation. And I was telling them that one of the things that I loved about this installation is that it's flat and it has borders. Do you remember that world that was before somebody figured out that the Earth was round and where people actually drew maps of what happened when you reached the border? Well, it's like that. And the place where the world ended was called Finisterra, the end of the world. So now we are here at the end of the world, of this little world of green varnish. And 
reaching this border is frightening. When I was thinking about it from the scale of the little person that just did this trek, it is frightening and accelerating because you're at the border. And <laughs> the original plan for my talk is that you jump off the border. Um, but it's because at that point, you're faced with the choice that all explorers have faced before us, all of them. Do we turn around and keep to the world as we know it? And the fantasy of safety that that offers, because it's a fantasy. So we turn back into that little square and live there forever and ever? Or do we take on the challenge of integrating a whole new world to the world that inhabits us? and now have a garden that is bigger and more complex and more diverse. So when, we, when I was talking to the nomad people, it turns out that one of their, their chief designers is from Spain, and we were both rem reminded of this poem that I loosely translated. Wanderer, your footprints are the path and nothing, nothing else. Wanderer, there is no path. The footsteps make the path. And by turning the gaze back, you see the path that will never be stepped on again. Wanderer, there is no path, but just the wake trails on the sea. No matter what we do, whether we turn back or go forward, whether we jump off or go forward, the world as we knew it is never going to be there. We just have to figure out ways of learning that and embracing that so that we can build the world as it can be. Um, and finally, we're faced with reality. And I wanted to bring this up because Mark Rothko in 1943 um, wrote this manifesto with some colleagues. And one of the things that he said that made me understand the power of art and the power of uh, thinking metaphorically is that uh, we have to abandon the fantasy of a reality so that we can start exploring truth. So when he started painting the blotches, uh, what I'm going to call the blotches, which I love and adore and I think some of the most beautiful art in the world, uh, what he was saying was, I, I'm moving away from a representational form of art because while that is great and that might work for some people, my job is to try to create placeholders for this other world that cannot be seen or explained or narrated or documented in any other language that we know of right now. So that in the future, maybe somebody will look at this and with the brains we will have in a thousand years, say, oh, so that's what that meant. For now, they are just a sensation. And he did talk about that. He, he painted very big. And one of the things that I loved about his paintings is that he didn't paint murals. People think of their paint, the paintings as murals. He wanted people to be inside the painting. So he would recommend people to stand 18 inches or closer to the painting so that you would be enveloped by the blotch and by all of that color. And he would take it as a really good thing if people would cry when they were in front of his work because he wanted that. He wanted you to understand with your body and your spirit what words cannot tell you yet. Uh, and I think... <clears throat> The, the reason I've enjoyed this project so much is because it's allowed me to do that while thinking about it, also enjoying the presence of this um, really beautiful installation. And that's pretty much it. Thank you.